In terms of video subjects we've discussed so far on the channel, one of my absolute favourites as of so far was discussing missing pieces of UK children's media. A lot of that is down to personal bias for growing up with many of these classic shows. That was just so rewarding reading that whole comment section, either reintroducing people to their favourite childhood show, or introducing a new group to some of these titles. So I've decided to start a brand new video series to take an in-depth look on several lost British gems. So if you've got any recommendations on what I should look at in the future then all by means leave it in the comment section down below. And if you're new here and this seems like your cup of tea then be sure to subscribe as it would be great to have you along the journey of covering more missing pieces of media. Okay with the context out of the way let's begin our journey. Pretty much much all the programs on today's list I grew up watching as a wee lad. That is, with the exception of our first subject. Airing back in the 50s, I wasn't exactly alive round about that time. Eight years after the publication of the first entry of the Railway series, the BBC had approached Eric Marriott, editor of the books, to inquire to do an adaptation on at least two of the train books that could be featured in the Watch With Mother Hour. And only after a month of negotiation with Wilbur Audrey, the BBC not only gained permission to make the programme, but things were already being built and prepared for filming. The conditions for the BBC were they could adapt it, as long as the story stories were mainly faithful, using double O gauge model trains. They used three Duchess of Avon models and a tank engine model, modified to look like their illustrated counterpart. They were supplied by PR Wickhams, who has had firm experience beforehand making model trains based on those that were seen in the Railway series. The pictures you're seeing right now, while they are Wickham's work, they've been used over the years to illustrate what the programme may have looked like. But it is believed and widely accepted that these models were never used for the show. The narrator of the program would be Judy Lang, having previous experience on the radio listening with Mother. While they were advised to make the story faithful, the writers made the story flexible to fit within a 10 minute runtime, adapting the sad story of Henry as the first episode. The show would be given the name The Free Railway Engines and would be broadcast on the 14th of June. At the time, the only practical way to broadcast television was that it all had to be done live. Thus, the action of the models, Judy Lang's narration would all be done in real time, although the track of the music was pre-recorded and it would be played on top. Pre-made sound effects were also at the ready, such as foley of steam engine noises. The sets were built and photographed within Lying Roan Studios. There were specially made painted backdrops for the production that heavily emulated the illustrations of the books. And a pre-made special effect, superimposed rain, to be laid on top of the picture. So a lot of complicated gears at play, and remember, this was all done simultaneously at the same time, live. So there was a lot of room for error. They only really had a month to put everything together. Things like the sets were only just scrambled together in time. And reportedly during the broadcast, the train movements were rather jerky. This would lead us to what Reverend Audrey would refer to as the elementary mistake. As the train was moving along the tracks in the program, the connector points did not connect it properly, causing the model to derail. Thus, to get the storyline back on track, a stagehand had to come in and manually put the train back on its tracks. All the while this was being telecast live, leading the narrator Judy Lang to somewhat improvise. By Tuesday the 23rd, newspapers were having a field day reporting on the disastrous broadcast. This overshadowed major news outlets of its day, like the trial of John Christie. Not exactly something you want to be compared to for your new children's series. Thus that week's episode, which would have been an adaptation of Edward, Gordon and Henry, was first delayed and eventually cancelled. 
as things with BBC management and Reverend Audrey deteriorated behind the scenes. This incident would become perhaps the most famous BBC blooper of all time. Although, over the course of 68 years, there was absolutely no visual imagery to reference on, with the only thing to refer to were just newspaper clippings proving that it did once existed, along with a mention within a TV guide. It wouldn't be until February of 2021 that the newspaper for retired BBC pension scheme members that it features a tantalising summary of the infamous railway production, revealing that the letters and documents still exist, and a visual picture of James that was used for the production, making it, as far as we currently know, the only photograph of the whole show. Now, what are the chances that any recordings still exist for the sad story of Henry adaptation of 53? At the time of its production, there would have only been two possible ways into the BBC preserving and archiving the broadcast. The most common at the time was called telerecording, where explaining it in its most simplest term, you have a video camera recording a TV monitor, photographing the content on 35mm film, which the material is immensely expensive expensive thus would have only been reserved for either very special occasions, such as historical milestones like the Queen's coronation, or if the BBC felt like that the programme would have had any further commercial value. The quite a mass experiment that was broadcast a month after the Thomas pilot did had its first two episodes recorded in this manner, as the BBC had distribution plans for the series, as it was the first quite sizeable original project for the broadcaster since pre-World War II. However, the quality of the recording was far from desirable. You can even see an insect insert itself on episode 2. Thus, the BBC decided to discontinue recording the remaining four episodes. There was another recording technology at the time, although this was only semi-available. The year previously, Peter Axon was given the task of creating a more cost-effective technique of recording programs. He began dabbling into making recordings on magnetic tapes, rather than the film element. This would be the same tape material that would be used for sound cassettes. The picture would be significantly in inferior quality compared to that to footage photographed on film, but would largely be the main standard that the BBC would record their programmes on for the next several decades. Within the next five years, Axon would create the device Vera, although Vera only had a recording runtime of 15 minutes. The BBC did a Robin Hood series in March of 1953, the same year as the pilot episode for the Railway series. And while the majority of the show is lost, we do have a partial recording of episode 2, likely being one of the earliest recordings to Axon's videotapes. With the show being done live, you can notice many imperfections from the surviving footage, such as the projected background running a flicker, Ah, oh, sir. Nay, I couldn't say there. No horses here about. So, if the railway pilot was ever recorded via this method, it would only be a partial recording. But the thing is, we have no real evidence to say that the show was a priority to archive. Chances are, it may have never been recorded to begin with, making it a piece of media fated to be forever lost. But even so, if we were to give everything the benefit of the doubt, the BBC placed down additional funding for it to be recorded on 35mm film, or maybe Axon recorded it as part of his experiment for his new technology. In the pamphlet, it pretty much confirms that the BBC doesn't have any copies of the programme. Now, I never like to say, never say never, but in the realm of lost media, the older something is, the less likely it will ever turn up as there are just far fewer options of avenues and loopholes to go down to for it to be preserved. In other words, it's going to have to be one heck of a miracle for a copy of this program to ever turn up. But hey, maybe one day we can gain access to all the surviving documents of the show. As the article says, from there we can imagine the whole tobacco in our imaginations.
airing from mid-1986 all the way up to late 1994, was the Yorkshire television series Raggy Dolls that aired on ITV. It comprised of nine seasons and 112 episodes, with the whole programme being narrated by Neil Innes, who contributed much of the writing of the series. The show follows seven Raggy Dolls, who all were placed within the reject bin for featuring some kind of defect. There's Princess, where her backstory is seen in the intro of the show. She was meant to be a luxurious princess doll, but via the lack of material and the machines accidentally tearing her suit apart, she's not within the same look or style as her other duplicates. Then there's Dottie with splatter of paint all over her, Lucy with loose limbs that drop off rather easily, High Five who's got a speech impediment, Back to front where his head was accidentally placed on the wrong way round. Sad sack where they placed in too much stuffing in his belly, making him extra cuddly. And Claude the French doll, there's nothing really wrong with him, they just accidentally forgot to ship him out to France. The Raggy Dolls band together in a group and go on wondrous adventures, sometimes secretly helping out Mr. Grimes, who runs the factory, and there are some recurring characters in the show, such as Mr. Grimes' old childhood teddy bear, Rupert the Roo, a kangaroo toy from Australia, and occasionally other family members from Mr. Grime. Between 2010 and 2011, the first four series were released to DVD, and on the season 3 DVD they got Neil Innes to do an audio commentary on the episode The Terrible Storm. What do you think, Sad Sack? I'd rather listen to the story. Suit yourself. The physical releases are now out of print and can be really expensive on the secondary market. Thankfully, for our benefit, Garrett Gilcrest has uploaded the DVD content on archive.org. And despite the persistence from fans, the remaining seasons are still a little bit inaccessible, making them lost media. In terms of what has been uncovered over the years, three season 8 episodes have been purchased directly from the ITV archive, by financial contribution of Tugsman, Amber the Fangirl and the Starwin. They would be later uploaded to archive.org. Typically, the cost of purchasing directly from the ITV archive. Buying one episode, the cost starts at about £75. And then every additional episode purchased within the package being about £35. Typically, direct purchasing from the ITV archive is only meant to be for educational and personal use. But aside from the bot copyright claim, the ITV company have mainly left Raggedoll uploads untouched on YouTube. In 2019, Mark Mason uploaded a showreel of the Raggedolls, containing clips and footage that belongs to some of the lost Raggedoll episodes, and higher quality images of the missing Raggedoll episodes can be found on the website Shutterstock. So let's break down to see what we currently have available and what's still missing. Airing on the 6th of September of 1990 was Witch's Witch. The Raggy Dolls are preparing for a Halloween party, where High Five and Back to Front promises that there's going to be a spectacular laser show at the evening event. However, things don't quite go according to plan for when a witch attempts to spoil the Raggy Dolls' evening. However, the gang are unaware of the witch's presence, and mistakes her meddling as being part of the laser show. Eventually, their laughter drives the witch away. High Five and Back to Front, unaware of the commotion, feel defeated that things didn't quite go according to plan. But the rest of the dolls let them know that they had a jolly good time and laugh all the way back home. Airing on the 13th of September of 1990 was Bonfire Night. The date in this episode is on the 5th of November, which in Britain is an annual celebration of the defeat of Guy Fawkes. Claude with a French background is unfamiliar with the UK tradition, thus the rest of the Raggy Dolls decide to take him out to experience his first bonfire night. But things take a very drastic turn, for when Claude is captured by some young lads, where they bring him to an abandoned factory, where they plan to tie him to their fireworks. The gang must drastically think of a plan to free Claude before he goes up with the sparks. Eventually, one domino effect to another leads to the whole factory being up in flames. High Five calls the firefighters, where the boys, startled by their own fireworks accidentally going off, are scared away, and the Raggy Dolls are just able to save Claude in the nick of time. Airing on the 20th of September of 1990 is Rainbow's End where Princess is determined to travel to the very end of the rainbow to find a pot of gold. But along her journey, she comes to realise that good friends mean so much more to her than a measly old pot of gold. As of the time of recording, I couldn't find any images or clips of this episode. 
airing on the 27th of September of 1990 is Lost in Space, where the Raggy Dolls are abducted by some aliens and go out of this world. Along their journey, High Five befriends an alien where just like him, he as well stutters. Airing on the 4th of October of 1990 was Roman Ramblers. The Raggy Dolls go out on a wilderness hike, but being disorientated by the warming hot sun, they get lost. But stumbling upon some remnants of the Romans, it may just help them to point them into the right direction. Meanwhile, Sad Sag dreams that they travelled all the way back in time to the days of the Romans. Airing on the 11th of October of 1990 is The Great Expedition, where the gang find themselves deep in the jungle, where they stumble upon a gorilla. Out of all the episodes of Season 5 so far, only The Great Expedition has resurfaced online, via an off-air recording uploaded on YouTube of Johnson & Noddy. Unfortunately, the recording has very poor sound. By now, Sadzak was fully awake and being offered a banana. Although, if you're an audio engineer, then it may be possible to salvage the sound. Sadzak sleepily opened his eyes. He looked at the gorilla and smiled. Unfortunately, these next three episodes have very short descriptions with no pictures to accompany them, so we'll keep them rather brief. The Twitcher features a character of that same name, where the Raggy Dolls find out the identity to this character, and two bosses where Dottie learns a thing or two about the consequences of being, well, so bossy. And airing on November 1st of 1990 is the Toy Fair. The Raggy Dolls attend a Toy Fair, but a monkey runs loose causing chaos to the shop. The next three episodes are actually quite unique, as they all share a continuity between one another acting as a small trilogy. They feature the inclusion of an eighth Raggy Doll member, Ragamuffin, who has lost their owner and is now a travelling wandering doll, and sticks with the Raggy Doll gang for a short time, before leaving in fond farewells. The only visual imagery out of the three we have is from Grand Prix Dolls, with a very short clip. This wouldn't be the final time we would see Ragamuffin, as he would later reappear in further adventures. Airing on the 29th of November of 1990, the final episode of Series 5 is Doctor Dolls, where the Raggy Dolls play the good old game Doctors and Nurses. Airing on the 6th of September of 1991 is Old Fashioned Dolls, where the Raggy Dolls encountering a young lad named Edward, hey, it's my name, who appears to be quite a big fan of a show that seems to be very similar to Teenage Mutant Hero Turtles. They teach the young boy about old fashioned things. Oh, by the way, I've got to say it, I love Edward's Kermit costume. Airing on the 13th of September of 1991 is Lady Luck. In this episode, the Raggy Dolls meet a mysterious woman named Lady Luck, where she takes the dolls on a magical adventure. Our next episode, Invisible Dolls, is actually the only one from Season 6 which is partially found. It's available on YouTube as an Icelandic dub. The picture quality is not superb, but hey, it's the best we have as of right now. Being in another language is a bit difficult to make out as to what the plot is meant to be. <laughs> And the only information that's online about the episode is that today, the Raggy Dolls decide to go invisible. Airing on the 27th of September of 1991 is The Great Outdoors. The Raggy Dolls hitches a ride on Mr. Grimes' camping holiday. After getting comfortable in their homemade tents and sleeping bags, they find out that a climber may be in trouble, so they quickly intervene to come to the rescue. Airing on the 4th of October of 1991 is The Boomerang Game where sadly there is no visual record of this episode. Although at the very least we do know that it was about Rupert teaching the Raggy Dolls about a boomerang. Airing on the 11th of October of 1991 was Down on the Farm, about the Raggy Dolls and Rupert having a good old day out down at the farm. Airing on the 18th of October of 1993 is The Lonely Echo, about the Raggy Dolls adventuring in the countryside, stumbling upon a sentient cliff face. Airing on the 25th of October of 1991 is Homeward Bound. It appears that the Raggy Dolls are on an adventure in the countryside, and they eventually come to realise that there's no place like home. Airing on the 1st of November of 1991 is Railway Dolls, where the Raggy Doll gang go out on a day trip and having fun at the station. Airing on November 8th of 1991 is Windy Weather, where a gust of wind blows a baby crow out of their nest. Back to front using the ingenuity of his kite and the assistance of a helpful cow, they're able to get the crow back up to the treetops. 
airing on the 15th of November of 1991, in Purple Diamonds, the Raggy Dolls dig up some purple rock believing to be worth a fortune. Thus, they spend the day daydreaming on what they could spend on their fortunes. But by the end, Mr. Marmalade the Cat relays the news that it's only an amethyst and isn't really worth too much. And the penultimate episode of the season is The Giant Bumblebee, airing on the 22nd of November 1991. Mr. Grimes is left to look after his twin nephews, named Oz and Boz. But when the Raggy Dolls find out that they're spending the afternoon collecting up bugs, trapping them with no air holes to breathe through, they disguise Sad Sack as a giant hornet, teaching the twins a valuable lesson. And then the final episode of this season, airing on the 29th of November of 1991, The Return of Rue, features Rupert the Rue returning back from Australia to the excitement of the Raggy Dolls. And that concludes all the episodes from season 6. Season 7 of the Raggy Dolls is virtually complete online and you can watch nearly all the episodes, with the exception of the first episode of the season, named The Royal County Show, where Rupert the Roo and the Raggy Doll Gang attend the local Royal County Show. Season 8 as well is nearly complete, with the exception of three odd episodes. One of the three is partially found, The Robot Canteen. It's available online, but only as a Swedish dub, about Mr. Grimes bringing a robot to do the chores. In the other missing episode, Town Gala, the Raggy Dolls watches on with suspense, as Mr. Grimes does a skive dive, and it looks like Sad Sack may have been dragged into the excitement. And in the final episode of Season 8, named Wedding Bells, Mr. Grimes is far too shy and nervous to confess his feelings to his dear Cynthia. So the Raggy Dolls take the situation into their own hands, playing their role of Cupid. And one thing leads to another, and the both of them get married by the end of the episode. And it concludes with Cynthia taking the Raggy Dolls back home with them. And this bleeds over to the next and final season, Series 9, where the Raggy Dolls now reside in the cottage with the newlywed couple. And they secretly accompany them on their honeymoon, taking a cruise around Europe, which the story arc goes on for about five episodes of the series. And unlike the last several seasons, you can watch Season 9 in its whole on YouTube. A quarter of the show is still missing, so here's hoping that more episodes will be uncovered. If we all band together, you never know what could be achievable. This is uh, Neil Innes saying, look after one another, and bye for now. It was in early 1982 in Boreham Wood, just located outside of London considered to be the Hollywood of Britain, that there was a studio in the post-production stage working on the visual effects to the Dark Crystal. It was at this time that they took on Nick Park for a student placement. Now, he wasn't allowed to participate in the practical side, instead he was reserved for T-Boy. But it was during this time that he was starting to think of ideas of what to do for his final major of education, and observing the creative elements around him began to inspire him to finally click ideas of what to do. His concept was a short film of a man that he had been designing in his sketchbooks, who would build himself a rocket ship in his basement to go off to the moon for a picnic. The middle-aged man, later to be named Wallace, Nick Park would later attribute that his real-life father aided as an influence for the character. I feel it. When I see him on film, I think I can see a bit of something. Recalling a reminiscent childhood story where his dad would make a caravan nearly from scratch with little to no blueprints and would use that to take the family on holiday to Wales. It was kind of wallpapered and you know, it was like a little home inside, like the rocket. And no questioning whether it was practical, we just kind of did it and, and that's what made you know, my own childhood so exciting. I couldn't believe how much of my own childhood story, you know, my family and, and that actually comes through in this film. It was during that student placement that him and a friend would write the first draft in one evening in a pub at Notting Hill Gate. Nick felt that it would be most suitable for the man to have some companion to join him for the adventure. 
he initially envisioned the companion to be a pet cat, but as he was sculpting the character out of clay, he ended up creating the feline into a reasonably sized dog. Finding the build much more easier to articulate in front of the camera, the dog would once again be majorly redesigned and given the name Gromit. The voice for Wallace was done by Peter Salas, who did the gig for the poor student for an extremely low fee, which was about 50 quid, which from the early 80s to the early 2020s would now be about shy of £200. Salas was rather flexible with the young student, first providing him with a sample tape to see if he liked the demo before making the investment. One of Nick Park's tutors in film school was Peter Sargent, who had worked with the BBC on the Andy Pandy series, and recommended to Nick to get the voice actor Peter Hawkins involved with the short film, as he had worked on numerous of Watching With Mother programmes, being a sort of British equivalent to Mel Blanc. Are you a little bit like that clock that <laughs> That sounds like one of the words, doesn't it? We'll all be fluent Swedish that, entry. Yeah. Although Peter Hawkins is best well known amongst the British sci-fi craft for being the original voice of the Daleks in Doctor Who. Mum was down there very low, and the next mum was there, and there was a terribly high one like that. Annihilate! 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 Nick had cast Hawkins to play the role of Gromit, reported to have used the same voice as Spotty Dog in The Wooden Tops. <laughs> A beloved show from Nick Park's childhood. Like in the wooden tops, I always used to wonder why they don't go and play on the hills over there. Why do they stick in the farmyard? It's so boring. And what I didn't realise as a kid was that, that those hills were just a cardboard cutout. And I, I love that. Illusion. Oh, it's an illusion, isn't it? I think yeah. that's what fascinated me, actually, and yeah. Peter. I mean, I... Peter Hawkins had completed all of Gromit's dialogue in one morning although Nick hadn't quite anticipated on how difficult it was going to be to sync up and animate the mouth movements. His first shot of Gromit was when he was aiding as a stool, with no clear angle of his mouth and just looking directly at his monobrow. It was in that moment that Nick decided to make Gromit into a mute character, just to purely save on the amount of time it would have taken to animate his mouth, and this was an easy addition to rid away with as there was nothing in terms of significant dialogue that Gromit said in the original audio. More or less, it was repetitive dialogue repeating everything that Wallace had said. Repeating everything Wallace said, mm. kind of in a kind of like, <laughs> where's the role of history? <laughs> you know, sort of voice. And um, well, I didn't use it in the end because I found it was too much effort to make his mouth mm. move, mm. and Wallace's as well. In the final Grand Day Out episode, we do hear Gromit snore. Tell you what, Gromit lad and whimper. <laughs> Although of these voice samples were done by Peter Hawkins has never been confirmed. As well, none of Gromit's original dialogue has ever been heard by the public. After two years of animation, Nick Park had only completed about 10 minutes of a grand day out. With the building montage, only a single paragraph in the script took about 18 months to animate. Nick had ran out of money and overshot his deadline. Thankfully, the British animation company Ardman were opening up a new studio down at Bristol, and after the company's two founders, Peter and Dave, visit Nick and his film school. Impressed by his work, they offered to take the young student on, to aid them to other projects while completing a grand day out. So we said, well, it's crazy, Nick, you're never going to finish your film here. You know, you're a great animator, but you're kind of wasting time. Why not come and join us? And we'll help you finish grand day out. Nick had some fairly grand ideas for the short film. When they landed on the moon, they would have encountered a burger bar at McDonald's on the moon, filled with robots and alien creatures reminiscent of the cantina scene in Star Wars, and it would have all culminated in a grand finale with a prison breakout sequence. After his first year staying with Ardman, he had presented to what he had done so far to a Canada film board, pitching it to them as a 40-minute film, although one of the attendees told Nick that by the sound of his concept that it was going to take him close to another decade to complete the film. So on his way back home, Nick decided to restructure the film to complete it within a year, cutting down the runtime to 20 minutes and having only one antagonist in the final act, that being the parking meter robot, which only had a very small role in the original script. The film got completed in 1989 and the following year it was broadcast on Channel 4 during the Christmas season. During the completion of A Grand Day Out, Nick Park had actually created another claymation film, that being Creature Comforts, which were both nominated at the 1991 Academy Awards, with Creature Comforts winning out. Nick, wow. could you perhaps give us the look that you had just as that was being thrust into your face? Nick! Oh, 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 Nick! O
Yeah, so yeah, yeah. Oh, what right. did you actually yeah. say? Because I had two films nominated, I had a list of two credits, and I was scared of reading the wrong list. Oh, no. And in the end, I was just too nervous to even look at the did list. Did you babble like so a fool? I did. And uh, thanks to Spike and Mike for bringing me here. Both of these short films would later receive multiple follow ups, further pushing Ardman's popularity around the world. But referring back to our original missing media topic, what are the chances that we'll see any of the original elements for a grand day out? Nick Park has stated that he does have the original audio still for Peter Salas, and since the original script would have been the only version Peter Salas would have read off, as no additional voice work ever took place, maybe those deleted scenes for the original version of a grand day out still exist via Wallace's dialogue. And what's to say Nick Park doesn't have the original recordings of Peter Hawkins? So maybe Gromit's dialogue still exists as well. And while it seems that Nick Park never got to any of the later sequences within the original script, alas no stop motion alien footage, if the original script were to become available, that would be a fairly good blueprint to imagine on what the original version could have been like, giving us a true flavour on the unmade deleted scenes. And while I personally could envision Gromit with a voice, I would be lying if I said that I wasn't extremely curious to see an alternative version of a grand day out. Set coordinates for 62 West Wallaby Street. <laughs> West Wallaby Street. <laughs> Airing on the BBC from 1989 to 1999 for nine seasons was Bodger and Badger. The show followed Simon Bodger and the antics with his misbehaving Badger, who had an intrigued sweet tooth over mashed potato. From season one to four, Simon was a handyman who would keep Badger a secret from his bosses. The first series, Bodger was a cook working in a cafe. Series two to three, he was at a school setting. And in season four, he was in Chesterton Worlds of Adventures, a real life theme park in Britain. And then the remainder of the series featured Bodger and Badger living in rental apartments. From series five onwards featured a new character, Mousy played by the actor's Bodger's then partner, Jane Bassett. She additionally played Millie the Milkwoman. The relationship didn't last, but they maintain of being good friends. The show had a grand total of 124 episodes, and reruns continue up until 2008. This was the first show I can ever remember watching being fairly upset that it was taken off air. In 2007, Bodger and Badger were meant to be part of an advertising scheme of promoting the mashed potato brand Smash. Two ads were fully filmed, but given the fact that Badger was partially owned by the BBC, which is a government funded company, so they can't indulge into product placement, so the ads went unaired and to date have never been released to the public. Bodger and Badger were actually quite popular among students, earning a cold light status. So Bodger's actor, Andy Cunningham, would do various student night gigs across the country. Sadly, due to a battle of cancer, Andy would pass away in 2017 at the age of 67, just tragically far too young. Although recently an actor by the name of Ash has taken up the puppet of Badger and has slowly been continuing on keeping Badger alive. In 2022, they've done videos for Badger Trust, a charity that Andy Cunningham was involved with near to the end of his life. The series never received a home media release, and now that it's no longer airing on the BBC or streaming on any platform, viewers have had to rely on unofficial uploads to the internet to watch the full show. Unsurprisingly, with fans only given limited resources, it's made the availability of the episode count rather spotty. The majority of season one was uploaded by Bodger and Badger for DVD, who ran a campaign during the late 2000s to get the series released on home media. The first episode was uploaded by YouTuber Central South 5, and then the final episode of the season, episode 8, was uploaded by Chris. Named the final episode, but they were a long way off yet. We're still missing episode 2, 5, 6 from the first season. Bodger and Badger 4 DVD has mostly been able to upload the entirety of season 2, with the exception of episode 2, which unfortunately they didn't have a copy of, and thus has remained lost. 
Season 3 has been mainly found by Matthew3468 and Chris, with only one missing episode, episode 3, still missing from that lineup. As for Season 4, Lewis Pringle has found episode 4, but has mislabeled it as episode 3. Um, easy rookie mistake. But out of a lineup of 9, episode 4 is the only one that's currently been found. Episode 8 of the season has been given the name Wet Paint, which the titles reuse in episode 5 of season 6. Seven. So if you've got an episode called Wet Paint, then definitely double check to see which season it comes from. Season 5, Episode 1, 4, 7, 9, 11, 12 and 13 are all completely lost. This was the season that introduced Mousy, and sadly, her introduction episode, the beginning of the series, is lost. Thankfully, for the remaining episodes, they're all online, with the exception of episode 9 from series 8. Although Liam Shepard did have a copy of the episode on his free view box, however, he didn't know on how to extract the episode and upload it online, so he's only been able to release it in the capacity of a video camera recording. <sighs> Jungle Run was the flagship kid game show on ITV, producing episodes from 1999 to 2006, with 8 seasons and a grand total of 99 episodes. Being produced by the commercial channel of ITV, they had the financial resources to really expand on the sets. When you compare it to other children's game shows of the time, particularly on the rival channel the BBC, where since the company was government funded, they had to ration out their expenditures for other programming. Raven was primarily filmed on location in Scotland, where there weren't so many sets that needed to be constructed, and then Trap primarily is only set on one location, with the room being redecorated with each new challenge. In comparison, Jungle Run has multiple sets to explore. The first two seasons, the host was Dominic Wood, who would open up each episode by doing a little bit of jungle magic. The format of the early seasons of the team comprising of four members, where they would do a series of four challenges, where they had to collect up bananas, there being a hundred to collect in each game, and then there was a mythical golden banana that was worth the equivalent of 50 points. The more bananas they had, the more time they had in the fifth and final challenge, the Temple of the Jungle King, where they had to complete a series of different challenges, which would slide the door to the next room. In each of these chambers, there would be a monkey of sniffing value, increasing the further the team went. When it was time to get out, they had to grab the highest value monkey they were able to reach, and the value of that monkey would correspond with the expense of their prize. However, all four team members needed to be out of the temple. If even one of them got locked in, then sadly, they go home with nothing, with the exception of a Jungle Run t-shirt and rucksack. Series 3 to 4 was hosted by Chris Jarvis. The look and format of the show was slightly revitalised. For one thing, the bananas were replaced by monkey statues, each one worth about 10 seconds for the final challenge. And then there's the ruby one worth an additional 20 seconds. This was likely done to give the team and the viewer a slightly better idea on how well they were performing, as in the original two seasons it wasn't exactly clear and a little bit confusing on how much time the team had made so far with their bananas. The colours would be slightly dialed back as the seasons would progress. The tone and music would be slightly dialed back as well, less uplifting and fun and more exhilarating and excitement. The two primates that would often foil the challenges called Sid and Elvis received brand new ape costumes. And while never seen in the show, the Jungle King was very much established of being very well alive, where in the original two seasons they made it explicit that he was an ancient icon of the jungle, and the five monkey statues would instead be four, stone, bronze, silver and the golden monkey. All of the statues needed to be retrieved by the end of the game, so the team could receive all their prizes. And this time round, if one of the team members got locked in, it wouldn't act as a consequence for the other members. Chris Jarvis played the role as the Jungle Guide as a bit more deadpan, not as humorous as Dom. And playing the Jungle Guide for the final four seasons of the show was Michael Underwood, a regular for CITV. He was like the best of both worlds between Chris and Dominic. He could be straight, but also add in a bit of sarcasm. We have had explorers who are 10 years old have done that puzzle <laughs> in 20 seconds. For Christmas, I'm buying you each a jigsaw. Only a two-piece jigsaw, because I don't want to push you. 
there may have been a few more changes, but overall the show was very much the same from Series 3 onwards. However, starting from Series 5, they would do special episodes, featuring celebrity guests from either other ITV programming, like Coronation Street where the actors are clearly having a laugh on the set. Absolutely You're not going to be very brilliant. happy with me now, because I dropped the ruby one. <laughs> <laughs> that was a lot of fun, it was a great episode. And my parents are aliens. That was pretty funny as well. One. Oh, what on? <laughs> or other celebrities such as the Christmas special featuring the Triple A band, who takes a second for them to catch on a little bit. Bit more Christmas, who comes? Who comes down the chimney? And another one featuring some Olympians. And no surprise, they do ridiculously well. There was a great moment where all three of you were just stood there like going. <laughs> well, everything else was all sorts of physical, and all of a sudden we had to use our brains and we were yeah. a bit like. Yeah. Oh. Reruns continued from series five to eight all the way up to the early 2010s, where the show was finally taken off the schedule. This is another British show where the only way to seek out Pacific episodes is via unofficial uploads to the internet. Although, being purely down to fans to re-seek many of the episodes, the availability of the season count is verily spotty. For years, some of the oldest seasons from 1 and 2 virtually had no episodes online. But round about the turn of 2020, there was an immense spike of rediscovered lost episodes. There hasn't really been any major rediscoveries since then, but let's go through to see what's currently available. Series 1 and 3, all episodes are found and can be easily accessed online. On the streaming platform BritBox, Season 1 is the only season that has been made fully available on the platform. In September of 2021, YouTube channel Nostalgia Kid UK TV had uploaded all the episodes from the first season, sourced directly from the ITV archive. It's believed that the channel had gained permission from ITV themselves to upload the episodes, as they don't feature the timestamp watermark, but it has not been confirmed. Out of the 13 episodes from Series 2, 9 are found, while 4 are still missing. Series 4 has 10 episodes, 5 of them are found, 3 of them missing, and 2 of them are partially found. The upload that's been given the name Jungle Run, Stephen, Kaylee, and Emma, is sadly missing the ending as it cuts abruptly during the Temple Challenge. And then there's another upload titled Jungle Run, two episodes possibly 2001, has its ending cut abruptly as well and features the ending from another Jungle Run episode. Season 5, out of 14 episodes, 8 are found and 6 are still missing. Season 6 is almost complete with the exception of one missing episode. Seasons 7 and 8 are virtually complete with the exception of one partially found episode. YouTube channel Matthew Shravels had uploaded two of these partially found episodes, but only in the quality of a video cam recording. So while not exactly in the best quality, we can still experience them. Born all the way back in the 1940s was Barry and Paul Elliott. They were two of six kids with their parents coming from show business. In fact, their two older half-brothers, Jimmy and Brian, led a successful stage career as the Patton Brothers. When Paul and Barry were fully grown up in the late 70s, them and their two other brothers did a variety act. That, I think, was 79, end of 79, into 1980. We weren't going to be the Patton Brothers. We were thinking name like uh, Laugh Brothers. Then we thought, no, we could get done by the Trades Descriptions Act if we don't get the laughs, you know. <laughs> but we'd surely make people chuckle, you know. <laughs> And that's more or less where it came up. Both pair of brothers went their own way, but Paul and Barry kept the Chuckle Brothers name. After Paul and Barry had a lucky run on television as the Chuckle Hounds, them and the BBC would go off and create easily the most iconic children's British programme ever made. I heard it once, it just clings to you, you can't stop singing it then. Chuckle Vision, Chuckle Vision, Chuckle Chuckle Vision. Chuckle Vision would go on for 21 seasons, making it, after Blue Peter, the longest running children's programme on BBC. The brothers were pretty much the Laurel and Hardy of the UK. They were also just as equally famous for their renowned stage shows. People think to entertain the adults, you've got to be rude or blue or... <coughs> you say what goes over the kids' heads, but it doesn't. Eight and under, maybe. But eight and over, they know what you're talking about. They know what you're doing. But how cucumber gag? You know, we do it so innocently. It's the audience that are saying it's something wrong with it. Go on, then, hurry up, hurry up, hurry up! It's not wiggling about! I can't 
can't help it, I'm nervous. Go on, chop it. Here, look, I'll hold it for you. Get <laughs> off. I can hold my own cucumber, thank you very much. He don't want me to slice it because I might catch his fingers. <laughs> oh, he put it through there, I can't get near your fingers. <laughs> it? And everybody just laughs at what they've done. A lot of their iconic catchphrases were already adaptable to the pantomime environment. Hello. Hello. You haven't. We have. You haven't. We have. Have you? It didn't. It didn't. Did it? The older brothers would eventually jump into the Chucklevision stage and show, being named and credited as Mr. No Slacking and Mr. Get Out of It. Their most insane attribute to their performance was on the humbling nature on how they approached everything. Grown ups running around are acting even stupider than we are some of the times. Any job that came along, we'd do it as the kid would do it. Not a tiny kid, but as like a 10, 11 year old would say, oh, well, it's easy that, you just get up and knock a nail in it, you know. <laughs> So that's the kind of thing we would do. You know what you've done? What? You've marked it in the wrong place. I didn't do it, you did it yourself. By season seven, Paul and Barry will promise a lifetime contract with the BBC, reassuring them that the show would continue on and on, only stopping if the brothers felt like that they couldn't continue on anymore. They said, uh, as far as we're concerned, you can stay until you want to retire. They got into an annual routine where during the fall of every year they would be filming new episodes of Chucklevision, with an annual average of 15 per season. Although season 20 and 21 only had 7 and 6 episodes respectfully, although season 21 would be the final one made for the BBC airing in 2009, Paul and Barry were not informed of this decision. Thus, when that time of year came back round again for making more Chucklevision episodes, they were rather confused as to why scripts weren't being sent through. When they tried asking the BBC as to what was going on. They responded that it was simply cheaper to just rerun the old episodes rather than make the new ones, as the repeats were still receiving immensely good ratings, with 292 episodes already made in the back catalogue. Although within the next few years they ran into complications of adequately keeping up the royalties. Thus they eventually stopped rerunning the episodes altogether, with the Chuckle Brothers leaving the annual TV slot of the BBC on Christmas Day of 2013. Paul and Barry were not amused, finding the excuses to be immensely flimsy at best. To date, the BBC have never stated an official confirmation as to why the show did not carry on, instead letting it fade away quietly in the background, which it was a real shame that Chucklevision was never given a chance for a true series finale. As well, the show has only received a rather spotty home media release. The first of these was in 1993 on a VHS release called The Goofy Golfers, which featured three episodes from season four. They included The Goofy Golfers, Plum Crazy, and Boulder Dash. This would be the only Chuckle Brothers VHS release of the main show. It wouldn't be until 18 years later Series 1 received a DVD release in 2011, followed by Series 2 the following year. Although it wouldn't be for another 5 years for Series 3 to finally make it to DVD, and that was as of 2022 the final home media release for any TV episodes of Chucklevision. Thankfully, with the show being widely popular in its country of origins, there were numerous off-air recordings made, and every episode is available to watch on YouTube, albeit in varying quality. But hey, at least the main programs aren't lost. Back while the new episodes were still being produced for the show, there were several professional recordings of their tour shows made that earned a physical home media release. These productions were just as significantly big and popular as the main program. The plots weren't really immensely weighty. The villain of Indiana Chuckle plans to use a casket filled with magic to take over the world. How do the Chuckle Brothers defeat him? They just obliviously open up the casket without knowing what's inside, accidentally letting all the magic out, so not much of a climax. You've let all the magic out, look there it goes! Is that the magic? Grab it, some in your pocket, save it for after. Have a bit of that. Yeah, but that's no good now. Hey. That would have made me rule the world. Oh, it's a good job we got it then, eh? But hey, these performances weren't about the story, instead they were all about the comedy and having a good time. Plus the on-stage bloopers, which there were plenty of, were worth the price of admission. I've only gone and killed my brother! And broken his leg. <laughs> In 1996, released on a very limited edition VHS run, was the Chuckle Brothers in Trouble, being appointed the new jobs as caretakers for a school. Eventually it would be re-released on DVD in 2008, 
The next was The Chuckle Brothers in The Pirates of the River Rother, filmed in 2005 but not released until 2007. That same year we received another DVD release, Spookies Going On. And then the final one was Indiana Chuckle, Kingdom of the Mythical Sulk. The company responsible for distributing these DVDs was Liberation Entertainment who went out of business shortly after the final Choco Brothers DVD, with no further stage shows receiving a home media release. But just like the physical releases of the main TV show, this is merely the tip of the iceberg, as there were many, many, many different stage shows made. A lot of them being self-parodies on the most famous properties that were released round about the time. And rather tragically, unlike the main TV show, where we have unofficial uploads to enjoy the majority of the episodes, there are no real any alternatives to experience these stage shows, meaning that a lot of these may very well be permanently lost. Chances are they were never professionally recorded to begin with. Although, there's always the chance of a fan recording could have maybe preserved one of these stage performances. Of course, an unofficial recording would be in bootleg quality, but it's likely our best option. But even so, a full-length bootleg recording is still immensely rare to come across. The only one I've ever personally come across is A Christmas Chuckle. I had downloaded it off YouTube about two years ago now, to be featured in my Top 70 UK list. But as I was doing research for this video, to my surprise the original upload is no longer up. I had practically accidentally saved the video, as if I hadn't have downloaded it to feature it in a previous video, you lot wouldn't be seeing clips right now. So, is it possible that there may have been other falling bootlegs uploaded to YouTube that have just mysteriously been taken down, becoming inadvertently lost yet again? There is a partially found Chuckle Brothers stage performance, uploaded by YouTube channel Tis Done, of the brothers doing their rendition of Jack and the Beanstalk at Swansea Gran, performed in either 95 or 96. The upload only features 25 minutes of the recording, Aside from that, the only other elements there are to see are just some brief clips from random performances over the years. There's always a chance that there may be other bootleg recordings hiding out there in private collections, as online there do appear to be other compilation clips which must be sourced from a lengthy recording, but what may be out there in private circles and how many of them may still exist is difficult to say. Two of the most desired Lost Chuckle Brothers stage shows are actually related to British franchises, so it seems most appropriate that we round things off discussing them. And now for our big movie, Harry Potter and the Witch's Cauldron. Paul, there's no electric. The Chuckle Brothers did two tour shows based on the Harry Potter franchise. The first of these in 2004 was named Barry Potty and his smarter brother Paul in the Chambers of Horror. I spoke to Headphones UK who actually remembers watching this performance back in the day. He recalls a routine near to the beginning of the performance, where the brothers change their last name, being who and him. This leads to a confused interlude, where Mr. No Slacking is trying to write down the register, but ends up getting confused with the names. What's your first name? What's my second name? Oh, don't start that again. On the release of the Chuckle Brothers in Trouble, you can see a rendition of this gag, where Paul is what and Barry is who. Oh, who? Yes. Barry who? That's it. And Paul what? Yes. Oh, now you're talking. <laughs> there was an amusing blooper where Mr. No Slacking accidentally says Willie. He reportedly handled it very well and quickly moved on. There was another unscripted incident where Paul was on top of a castle. He leaned on the rooftop. It then collapsed. He started laughing like crazy. Well, we'll just have to do it your way. <laughs> I am Bumblebo, guard of the Witch's Cauldron. Get me out of here! Seven years later, the Chuckle Brothers did another Harry Potter spoof, being named Barry Potty and his full blood brother, Paul, in the ghostly shadows. One of my viewers who actually saw this Chuckle Brothers stage show back in 2011 actually took some photographs of the performance and was kind enough to donate them in. We can just about make out the setup. It looks like that the Chuckle Brothers did their classroom routine in this performance as well, with Mr. No Slacking acting as the teacher. You can see the rendition of this in the Chuckle Brothers in Trouble. There are a couple of professionally made photographs, but aside from that, there's not much else that can be visually found of the stage performance online today. 
Another Lost Trucker Brothers stage show that's in high demand for fans is Dr. Watt, The Return of the Garlics. The plot features Paul and Barry trying to get a new job at a restaurant, but then they accidentally get plunged into the TARDIS, whisked away to an alien planet filled with gunge and gorillas. Now as for the titular garlic slash Daleks, from eyewitness accounts there was only one Dalek that was seen during the performance and not for very long. The real villain of the piece is called the Mister, who plans to take over the world, who's played by Mister Get Out of It. There's an amusing pie gang during the show, where the Chuckle Brothers find a food machine within the TARDIS, reminiscent of a food machine that was seen in the first Dalek story. Unlike the Harry Potter parody, there is some video footage that does exist of the Dr. Watt stage show. Staffordshire University did an interview with the boys while they were touring their Doctor Who stage show. They interviewed some of the audience who had just seen the show, but alas, no actual footage of the performance in the video. YouTube user Vampiricus, all the way back in 2006, uploaded two very low quality clips of the performance. One of these are the Chocker Brothers and Harmon Brothers singing the 12 Days of Christmas, but replacing the items with props that are more suitable to the Doctor Who setting. A notable trait during this act is where Paul takes one of the items and throws them off stage, leading to the other brothers being confused and wondering as to where their prop is. Hey, where's my skull's gone? <laughs> <What's the fun? laughs> And the other clip is at the end of the performance with a big dance finale, where Barry gets a little bit carried away with a whistle. Aside from these clips, the whole stage show cannot be watched. There might be a slim chance that some of it may have been filmed for a news round preview on March 23rd of 2006, so that could be very well a lead to follow through on for more footage. Sadly, half of these beloved brothers are no longer with us. Jimmy passed away in 2019 at the age of 87, and then the year previously, Barry passed away in 2018 at the age of 74. Brian, now 88, has retired from the act, but Paul is still going strong. Some of these stage shows may be permanently lost, but the enjoyment and the laughter they left behind will continue on, and that in itself is truly immortal. The day after he died, nearly every dream I have, Barry's there, he's there beside me. He, he, he didn't believe in the hereafter, he wasn't religious at all. But I always say, you, you'll, you'll find, you know, when you go, you'll realise that you're wrong. And I now think he's trying to let me know that he was wrong. That's why he's in the dreams, you know. <laughs>